Okay. What is a fair national carbon budget? And how do transform societies to stay within this budget? Um, <clears throat> I started here with, with the same picture as Kevin had from IPCC, and uh, we start from the 400 billion tons budget with 1.5 degrees. And I think we can all, when we talk about 1.7 degrees, I think we should expect um, higher probability. So it's either of these two that I think are, are reasonable to work with. I know that some people work with this thing, 50%. 50%. Uh, 500, um, 500 tons, but these are the ones that we usually work with. And then I made the same citation here. Um, we have to fundamental changes to our society functions. This is the transform. This is a definition of transformation in both IPCC and in IPES, the um, biodiversity. This may feel overwhelming at first, but the world is changing anyway, and will continue to change, so climate resilient development offers us a way to drive change to improve well-being. This is actually what we have to do, I think, and it's quite a uh, radical change compared to what we're doing right now. Here's IPES, for this is biodiversity equivalent to IPCC, and they say the same thing. When in transformation <clears throat> are more likely when we focus on visions for good life. So they talk about life quality instead of, 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 um, instead of GDP. And um, to move away from the current limited paradigm of economic growth. This is quite new. And as an economist, I've been pushing for this for, 20, for the last 25 years. And I'm surprised to see that only for the last two or three years, this has actually come into the main mainstream um, uh, scientific reports. And I think it's because, I mean, I think you agree with me, Kevin, that the, the evidence, the scientific evidence is so, so strong these days. So it's quite difficult, difficult to come to another conclusion than this. So now even economists working in these areas understand that we need fundamental change. It's a bit terrifying that when I had this discussion 20 years ago, it was more like, um, a systems critique to the development of present society. Now it's about survival. And so we need to make this systematic critique of, of development. So that, that's why I think uh, this, uh, I call it the, the unnecessary and counterproductive goal, um, economic growth. Because if we achieve, if low, low income countries achieve SDGs one to seven, which is the, the, the old millennium development goals, it's no way that you will not have growth. Of course, econ economy will grow when you make sure that you have good health and you have clean water and you have food and you have shelter and houses, hospitals, education, etc. There's no way that the economy will not grow if you do that. So you will have GDP growth automatically. If you do the opposite, if you start with GDP growth and you might get advice from the World Bank to invest in mining, which many counters do, then you might have growth, but you, have, you will not achieve SDGs 1 to 7. So I think this is a counter to it's a, it's a bad um, goal. And here, they should be simple and transparent and don't mix different categories. So I think there should be one budget for fossil carbon dioxide, including industrial processing. One budget for international transportation or you can include the, that in the first one, so it has all fossil fuels. The only reason why we don't treat them the same thing is that it's a bit difficult to, to allocate all these emissions to one country, because if, if most shippings go from Holland, but actually they ship a lot of things from Belgium, but uh, the Netherlands is more close to the, to, the, to the harbors, then they get accounted for all the exports and imports that Belgium is doing. So uh, Netherlands has a lot of shipping, uh, and Belgium has much less. But I think that's, I don't think that should be a big issue because the Netherlands get a lot of money from their transportation, from their shipping activities. But we should treat the, the, the non-carbon differently and we should treat the negative emissions differently. So here is the, uh, the tree plantation and um, nature-based solutions and tree plantations. 
there should be another one. And here is the carbon. Here is the uh, carbon capture storage. And here is when when the high income countries invest in low income countries. So there should be different issues, and we should do all of these things. All of these things are good, but we should keep on tracking different budgets, different currencies. So this is what we have been focusing on: the budget for fossil fuel. And we're not so far in included in international transportation, but we will do that because it's also important and it changes things for Sweden. Because Sweden has a lot of shipping, a um, lot of export sector from Sweden, um, and also aviation. This was the way I showed before. It's 5.9% um, starting from now. It increases um, very much if we don't start now. To be transparent, this should be a fossil budget without considering negative emissions. And because the negative emissions, I think we can do that to somehow compensate for the laggers for United States and Canada, Australia, which are very difficult because they are very dependent on fossil fuels. They will not make it. So they will focus on, on these things and they will have to finance negative emissions. But I think we should aim at having carbon budgets um, properly. And uh, this is so therefore this is not net, uh, not net zero. I, I put a cross on the net. So this is a real zero emissions for carbon dioxide, fossil fossil carbon dioxide. And uh, we play around here in our <coughs> analysis. Yeah, this was the one. If we wait, it's very fast. It requires much faster reduction if we don't do anything now. This was the one I showed before. So here is for Sweden, because Sweden has a bit similar uh, so than compared to the average in the world. So it's a similar, uh, similar challenge for Sweden. The challenge is uh, much more difficult, of course, for the United States of America. They must do this in 21% linear reduction. So it means four, four and a half years. Down to down to real zero, so of course it's very. It's, this is a, this principle of having equal per capita emission rights is quite quite impossible for, for the USA. This is for Brazil, India, and China, Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan is an outlier, and uh, I, I got this information from Isaac saying that, well, Kazakhstan had big problems to, to face this equal per capita principle. Yes, and the, it's a main, mainly oil producing country, and they export the stuff to China. So, that, of course, they, they need a lot of help to totally change the whole economy. Here is Nigeria, Indonesia. So most of the most developing countries have have similar to Indonesia, and African countries have more similar to to Nigeria. So they have no problems to with this principle, but Kazakhstan has. So what we do here, <clears throat> we do something called historically adjusted eco per capita allocation. Uh, this carbon budget for future emissions will increase. So the carbon budget from the carbon budget is the future uh, budget. So the carbon budget for 2022 will increase for all countries with low historical emissions. So, for example, for Indonesia, because they have lower than the, glo the global average historical emissions, uh, they will have even bigger budget from, 20, from 2022. Whereas countries with higher historical emissions, they get smaller carbon budgets from today for the future. So this is the way to, to address the um, differentiated responsibility for historical emissions. Um, at the same time, what the low-income countries need is not a larger carbon budget. What they need is more money to adapt and to invest in fossil-free energy. So we, we do, <clears throat> with this historically adjusted um, allocation, and developing countries with historically low emissions, they get a bigger carbon budget. 
And uh, this give, gives them even more room, even more time to continue to increase emissions for another 10 years before they start reducing emissions and reaching maybe a zero in 2070 or something. But actually, um, the best thing is that they don't need to, to use all this fossil uh, fuel budget. It's like uh, low-income people in Sweden. Uh, some people say that they need cheap petrol. So we should make petrol very cheap, because that's what low-income people need. And I think the opposite. I think what they need is money. If they, get if they get more money, then they can choose to use the money to buy petrol or to buy a bus ticket or something. So it's bad politics when you give a lot of oil and petrol to poor people. It's better if you give them money. So therefore, compensation should be in money, and we should not have stupid policies when, when you r lower the, the energy taxes uh, in order to help the poor people. So what happens then um, when we... Ah, this is what I, you, what I showed before. Um, so here, what, what we did, our historical per capita emission, uh, and those countries like the United States and Australia and Canada who have real problems to, to, um, to stay within the budget, they have liabilities to invest a lot in negative emissions, in uh, tree plantation, in uh, carbon capture and storage to keep the carbon back into the ground, and to give money uh, to loss and damage fund. So that's one way to solve, if you, if you cannot make up, if you not stay within the budget, then you have a um, liability to pay for these things. And then also, you can have the liability for, according to capacity, to economic capacity, to countries with high GDP per capita, like also United States, but also Sweden, should have a liability to finance renewable energy in developing countries according to their needs. So this is the way to address this uh, common but differentiated responsibility and respected capabilities with very clear different steps. So we will submit a paper here late, later this year. And we have shown here that the cumulative emissions from the last um, 31 years has been known, the United States have higher emissions compared to average. So compare the cumulative emissions with average uh, in the world. So India has much lower, it's a very large population. So they are the total, the, the most uh, below um, average and the United States the highest. And so China is, <clears throat> is um, Russia and China is, China is third after Russia. Sweden is invisible because Sweden is a small country. But when I do the same thing here per capita, then Sweden has higher uh, overshoot than China per capita. It's still the United States having the highest overshoot per capita, followed by Saudi Arabia this time, and then Russia and Germany. And per capita, it's most of the developing countries are like that. Yeah? Uh, this is per capita. This is per country. So it's the United States that has the highest overshoot. So these emissions, for the last 30, 31 years, 1990, compared to the global average emissions. So they are much higher than global average. And India is much lower than global, global average. So they are the two countries um, where you can talk about historical uh, unfairness. So really, in, so the United States should really compensate India for the industrial contribu contributed to the climate change. But this is per capita. And it's also interesting per capita. The illustration here per capita, um, so the United States has been above. The global average has been like, like, four, like four or five tons per capita. And Nigeria has been below all the time. So here's the same, four, four or five per tons per capita. So Nigeria has been below. And then we have two interesting countries. China was below until 2005 or something. And now China is above. So now we only talk about territorial emissions. This is territorial emissions, 
I mean, do not include international transportation. So both of these things would make China look a bit, a little bit better, and it would make Sweden look a lot worse if we include that. So Sweden is opposite. It was above until 2010, and then it's been below. And then we do something, something, our first analysis is actually based on uh, grandfathering. And we looked at the, the N NDCs, the National Determined Contributions, and we found that this is extremely difficult to understand because each government or each country, they, they make virtue of making non-transparent NDCs. Uh, and that's actually something called Carbon Action Tracker, um, <laughs> where they rate different countries according to how transparent it is. And it goes from extremely bad to bad. I think the UK had the best almost. Yeah, because it actually included international transportation in, in that NDCs. One of the few countries that did. But it, it's, so say we cannot make a scientific paper based on the NDCs because we do not even understand it. So then we made idealized NDCs. So we actually, we, we started from now the present level, so that, that's a grandfathering principle. Start from the present level of um, um, emissions today. And then we take the net zero commitment, because almost all countries have net zero commitment. Some have not um, ratified, some have it proposed, so it's not really decided, but most countries have a net zero commitment. And it's net zero. And now we say real zero, okay? So we make it a bit tougher for the governments. And then we assume a straight line. And then it's very straightforward to, to actually calculate what is, the, what is the cumulative emission, the future cumulative emissions. You start from the present level, and you know the, 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 the time when you have to go down to zero. So this idealized um, NDC budget is actually the, the claims that counties are doing, are taking. These are the claims different gov governments or counties have on the global carbon dioxide budget. And it's, really, it, it's an idea, so it's, it's a bit smaller than the, N, the NDCs actually, because uh, it is real zero. So it's the, real, the NDCs are quite larger claims than this. So these are idealized, uh, nice uh, NDCs. Uh, more tougher than the government's actual promise. And then we take the historical emissions. This is historical emissions. And this is the overshoot. So this is compared to the average emission. And for Sweden, uh, the idealized is 430, and the historical overshoot is 320. That means it's 110 million tons left, 2022. So when you count for historical, historical emissions, Sweden is one of the few developing count, developed countries that still has a budget in 2022. Most uh, industrialized countries have a negative budget um, uh, starting from 2022. Yes? 67% probability and 1.5 target. So it is quite tough, I agree, but I think we should stick to that target and then see, okay, so how can Germany, UK, United States solve that? And you see, that's actually problem only for the industrialized world. All these developing countries are doing fine. They still have a budget. Um, it doesn't mean that they will stay within the budget. They still have to invest a lot in solar and wind and other um, climate smart technologies to, to stay within the budget. But at least they have a large budget for the future. Because, and this budget has been bigger than, than here. For example, uh, Oh, Russia is adding 34 million tons, idealized indices. And this should be minus here. I don't understand why. No, it should be plus here. I get a bit confused here. Uh, it should not be red. Yeah, so the red color is wrong here. Um, so they won't have they so much left. So they will they have the same problems as Sweden. Yes, please. Yeah. And as Kevin pointed out in his uh, first slide, what, what matters? Um, here, it is very important to notice that historical emissions here start at 1919. Yes. 
as Kevin noted in uh, his very first slide, what counts in, in where we end up is uh, total emissions of the fossil era. Yes, the choice 1990, if you go back to 1970 or 1950 or 1900, then it just looks even worse for all industrialized countries. So it makes, it makes uh, uh, the, the allocation would be more favorable to developing countries and less favorable to, to developed countries. Uh, so, so this pattern will just um, increase this pattern. And the, the only reason why, why I chose 1990 here is that it, is, it was since 1990 when this thing was accepted as a global uh, problem by the international political community. But it has been a problem for, for 150 years, of course. But this is for... Um, so with this, with this method, so this is some kind of grandfathering principle, um, then we get down to, uh, to this. Then we have another, another method in the same paper, we do, we do this historically adjusted equal per capita. It becomes a bit similar. So then we start with the population here, and we have the equal per capita. We have not adjusted this yet for, for, for the future population projections because we didn't have the data, but we will, we will address that. So that will change a bit because some developing countries have very, very fast growing populations. So they will have a higher proportion of the budget in the future. So we will account for that also. But so far, we have this the equal per capita budget taking just from now without considering uh, historical, uh, well, without considering differentiated responsibility. And here is historical overshoot. So this minus this one then we come to historically adjusted, equal per, equal per capita. And we see it, it's the same countries, but Russia has now come down to, to minus, because, yeah, so they come down to minus. So ba basically, most of, almost all industrialized, industrialized countries have zero. They have a, a negative budget starting from now. So they don't have any budget at all. For all the future missions are just increasing the deficit. So this tells us where, what, how we have contributed. So this is actually an interpretation of the, of the fairness principle of the UNFCCC. And then comes, okay, so how do we solve that? How will these countries uh, pay off their duty, their, their overshoot? Um, and this is what I said, uh, they, they will pay it off by investing in negative emissions both carbon capture and storage together down on the ground. And uh, I agree with Kevin that uh, this carbon capture and storage, it will never succeed at the planetary scale as, as the IPCC is envisioning. But it will work at the smaller scale. And it's important that it is commercialized. And those who are polluters will pay for it. So we must get the liability correct. So, so they... So the large emitters will pay for carbon capture storage. And it's the only way that we can continue making cement, because we cannot make cement and concrete if we don't make carbon capture storage. And those people are emitting the most, they should of course pay for this thing. And as soon as you have to pay for this thing, then they will lose the interest to take up oil from the ground, because it's very uneconomic to first make, take up fossil fuels from the ground, and then use it, and then pay for it going back to the ground. It's very economic, uneconomic. And solar power and wind power is already cheaper than fossil fuels, even if you don't have to take it down, the carbon dioxide. So, but if we get this liability to get it down, I think that is a way. That is a way for global governance to make the liability to make it to Saudi Arabia and so on, and all the oil-producing countries. Why is this still... Um, radical mitigation is still realistic. Well, if you consider the co-benefits, it's not, it's not actually a bad idea. There's so many co-benefits of stop burning fossil fuels. And uh, the nature-based solutions are emphasized. Uh, you can do, I agree with Kevin that the, the primary reason why we should plant trees is not for climate. 
it's for having a good ecosystem health. Um, and therefore we should have trees that have many benefits, not just eucalyptus. And I hate to see this eucalyptus farms in African countries where they crowd out natural trees that don't, that don't grow as fast as eucalyptus. So of course, for the, the choice of trees when that they plant should not be based for climate only. That's, that's the wrong argument. They should plant uh, native trees that have multiple benefits, fruits and so on. So when tipping points considered, then it's also very realistic because we are taking risks that are not, not reasonable if, if um, going above 1.5 degrees. And the product based principle is taken seriously. They should pay for this. So we need some liability, we need some litigation, liability and, and rules in the WTO and OECD and European Union to get this. And to understand this, uh, we're, we're now getting a more polarized world, as everyone knows. We get more Trumpism, also in Sweden, the last election has been brought up about, about more, more, more Trumpist logic and more polarization. And the way to get to, to work against that is to have a climate citizen assembly. So we will make a first climate citizen, citizen assembly in Sweden, uh, in Fairtrans. We start uh, next December. And uh, this will be an international research. And we, have, we will select 100 people in Sweden, 100 um, 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 we, yeah, 100 citizens we were randomly picked and selected. And it's very important that you, that, you, that you don't just take the people who answer yes, that you have to really get all kind of categories, all the strata according to income, according to urban and rural divide, etc. And education and so on. So this will be, will be done here. And they will be working not only on climate politics, they also discuss things like transformation. Uh, what do we need to transform societies? Because as long as we have a gross society, it is very difficult to stay within the planetary boundaries and the climate boundaries. So the climate boundary, here's the planetary boundaries on top of this, uh, the safe and just space for humanity. And the bottom is the social foundation. So according to this model by Kate Rayworth, um, it's a classical um, ecological economic model, people need to, to use energy. Uh, and materials to get the social foundation. We need water and food, shelter, education and care, health care and so on, clean water. That takes a bit of natural resources. But we must not exceed the environmental ceiling here. So these are the only two goals in sustainable development. Economics is not an intrinsic goal. Economics is, a, economics is a means. It's a tool to achieve social and ecological objectives. Those are the only objectives we have, social and ecological. In the social, you can include political, you can include institutional, you can include everything that is social. And in the ecological, you can include everything that is, has to do with the biosphere. And the tools, economics is a tool, legislation is a, co is a tool, institutional. There's no institutional sustainability or or legal sustainability, or technological sustainability. All these things are tools to help us to ensure social sustainability and ecological sustainability. Don't confuse the means and the ends. And in this picture that is very common still in the European Union, for example, and so on, there are these three pillars. And they're not three pillars, they're two pillars. And the rest are instruments. The two intrinsic goals sustainable development and the rest are intrinsic. So by that I, I thank you very much. And I leave the floor to Kevin. Yeah, thank uh, Warm thank you. Uh, Kevin, uh, would you want to take your notes up here? Yeah. Just to be in the camera, basically. Yeah, so quickly open it out to other people. We're better yeah. ready. Um, yes. So the detailed way that we allocate out the incredibly small carbon budgets we have. We can argue about those various nuances. Um, what's the best way of doing that? Um, my, my, my personal, without going into the numbers, my personal feeling is that to sort of, to say to countries like the US, you have no budget. I'm not sure how 
how well that will go down trying to get them engaged. As I, I mean, from a pure fairness point of view, that's clearly the case. So I think we have to find some way that combining practicality with fairness, and that, that's probably why for us we use grandfathering, but only within the wealthy countries. And effectively, it means that basically whether you're Poland, the US, Sweden, the UK, you've got to be zero emissions within about 10 years, zero fossil fuel emissions. So they all come to the same end year, but it's going to be harder for, say, some like the US or Poland because they've got very high carbon infrastructures. But all wealthy countries would have to do that. We think that's probably slightly more appealing than, or less unappealing than, um, than saying to them, you know, you have no budget left. But even under what we've put in place, we've still got this transfer of, of money, finances to help with the poor countries deal with the, um, with leap, particularly leapfrogging over uh, the fossil fuel era. So if you think of the poorer parts of the world, I'm not now talking about this, the, uh, the, the Indies and the Chinas, I'm talking more about those countries that haven't yet embedded the fossil fuel infrastructure. And for those, really what, what we want to avoid is them embedding one at all. Because, I mean, firstly, it's very expensive, but there's a lot of pressure for them to do that. And some of them have their own oil and gas reserves anyway. But actually, they, they're in a position now with sufficient support, they could leapfrog and go straight to renewables, which would be, a, a, and more efficient um, infrastructure as well. So um, there's some disagreement there about what's the best tools for, for splitting the budget up. Um, but uh, I think... Yeah, the idea, yeah, the idealized NDCs, yeah, uh, they were very idealized, I think. Um, I mean, no, no country is looking to go to zero emissions. So the UK, which I say, unusually, the UK has really detailed underpinnings. You can look at the spreadsheet for every year. By 2050, the UK is still envisaging burning 30 or emitting 31 million tons of carbon dioxide. So in, in 2050, that's more per person allowing for population growth in 2050 from a UK citizen than a Kenyan emits today from fossil fuels. So it's deeply unfair and every country is looking to do that. They're, so if you look at the IEA scenarios, the, IEA, the International Energy Agency net zero emission scenario, which is the one that a lot of people use and say is very good, 25% 20, of all energy use in 2050 is fossil fuels. So th these scenarios are not clear of fossil fuels. 25% of the what they what the, the energy in 2050 is fossil fuels. Um, half of all energy in the IEA scenario is burning things. The other, the other quarter there is biomass. So do not do not think that, that any governments or official modeling bodies are thinking of eliminating fossil fuels. They're not. They're almost eliminating coal, not quite. They're almost eliminating coal. But they've got lots and lots of oil and gas right the way through, way beyond 2050. So when you, you assumed a zero in 2050, that's not what's been embedded in the scenarios. It's not what's been embedded in the NDCs. It, it is a goal, just like you have goals of 2010, yes. Yeah. So I, I need to, to, I think it's similar <laughs> to bring this. Yeah. Yes, I think, I mean, the, the first one with the um, idealized NDCs, I totally agree with you that it's idealized, so it's more radical and more ambitious than the actual NDCs. But I think it's, it's, coming, it's coming closer to, to your approach and you say that each country like Poland and the United States and Sweden should go down in 10 years. That's even more idealized. <laughs> yeah, oh, oh, I was thinking, so but I mean, maybe, maybe I misunderstood your idealized NDCs. I thought you were trying to make an assessment of what the countries were going to deliver or planning to deliver. No, it's okay, fine, yeah. Yeah, we've got to go to zero. Well, the very clear message is we need to go to zero fossil fuels very rapidly indeed. I mean, however we play out the exact numbers, you've got to get the emissions down from fossil fuels. And you cannot squeeze those emissions out of countries that barely emit. So you, you've got to take the emissions out of countries that are emitting. And we know who they are. They're primarily the wealthy countries of the world, and they are India, and they are China. And to be brutally honest, the rest of the world, from an emissions point of view, is, is almost nothing. So we are really talking about you know, quite small numbers of countries that need to eliminate fossil fuel use within, I would say, 10 years to 15 years at the very most for the wealthy countries and give a little bit more time for places like China and India, a little bit more, not a lot more time. And then the other countries need to leapfrog over fossil fuel era altogether. And the other thing, the, the one other point I will make, I like your comment at the end, the three pillars of sustainability to take economics out. Um, I don't think the economics, the way we see it is helpful um, e economics in its original root was stewardship of the household. Um, you know, oikonomia was it was a more positive way of thinking about economics. It wasn't about money or making making money. It was a much more about stewardship of the household. If it was that form of economics, then that's really the other two pillars. So I quite like the idea that we remove economics and just see it as a tool. 
the way we use it today. It's just a tool to deliver the real cuts. But otherwise, there's not, there's not a lot of disagreement, but I do think we have to find ways that we can bring countries on board. And I'm yet to be convinced by telling people, you've got no budget, <laughs> is, is, is the way forward. But, but yeah, it's, it's the analysis is... Uh, the, the idea with the idealized NDC is that um, then you are <laughs> because in, but both you and I are saying I mean you talk, you talk, about, you talk about we should uh, end cut emissions by ten years and there is no uh, how say it, uh, national sovereignty is not met because there is no decision in government saying that but there is a decision in government saying that we should have net zero by 2050 or 2060. So most governments have committed to a year. So I think I come a bit closer to, to, national so to respecting national sovereignty by, by using the, the, the net zero year. And then I redefine it, saying it's a real zero. Of course, so that is a bit of violence to, to sovereignty. <laughs> but, but I'm just guessing that the... I mean, we have to discuss this. This is all the maths. But the numbers underneath that... Okay, all right. The, the numbers, the numbers underneath that, I would have a guess, completely exceed the budget. So this is my point: is that I mean, you you're talking about a very high chance of 1.5, a 67 percent chance from today. That's 290 billion tons. 290. We're not going to do anything in the next year. That's all. Remember, every year we're losing 40. So we were, even if we had agreement this, even if we get agreement this week in Egypt, which we won't get, but let's imagine we did get, and every country said, okay, we, we, we see the big issues, we're going to bring emissions down really quickly. That will take at least two years. That's 80 billion, 80 billion tons of carbon dioxide. So I don't think we've got any chance now, even the 50-50 chance of 1.5, I think we've, we've pretty much blown that. So I think when you play out these budgets, they, that's why I'm saying really 10 or 15 years, if we're serious about anything near 1.5, and the chances of that are still pretty slim. There are some questions here. Question. I'm just tired of listening to you. Um, um, if I, I, I don't know if I've understood you, but we have no budget left, right? Both of you are saying kind of that. Got a few, yeah, but yeah, a small budget. And then my immediate conclusion or the only conclusion I can see well I'm an activist so it's kind of easy but it's a moratorium we stop everything now we do did we did it with you know, especially especially the UK during lockdown or in the pandemic so we can do it and and that's the only thing I can see that we can do and and it, if I don't know what your <laughs> experiences are but um, we did it and we didn't die or at least I didn't some, some died yes but from other reasons, not from stopping using fossil fuel, for example, not stop from using a car. We both saying about this for the wealthy parts of the world, we did reduce significantly in one year, but we have to do that every year. So yeah, but you, it's not just doing the same thing every year. You've got to do more. So imagine what we did in, in the COVID year. What would you do the following year on top of that? And the, but yeah, I. I yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm all in favour of that. All I'm saying is that when you play that out, even things like, and it's one bit we're not very good at yet, um, we can do things very differently. We, we, have to, we have to make sure our houses are really efficient and live in them differently. We have to fundamentally change our public transport system and get rid of private cars. But it, the process of doing that will require a lot of energy. So if, whilst you put a tram system in or a public trans transport system in, that requires a lot of energy to do that. And until you have that energy that's very low carbon, which is easier for Sweden at the moment, but if you're the US, how would you do it? You're going to use a lot of oil and, or Poland, even worse, a lot of coal-based energy to, make the, to build the infrastructure for public transport. And so I think there are issues about how we actually do do that when our energy system at the moment is still 80% reliant on fossil fuels. But I, I take your point, this is a fundamental change, and that's from where we were. I just see that that's the only, con I don't know, what about you, the rest of you sitting here? What, what's the conclusion? Yeah, what, what's the conclusion? What can you see? What can we do? We have no budget left. Point. I, I agree with you. And I think the way we usually solve that is rationing. When there's a war and there's less of meat or coffee or other important things, you do some rationing. 
uh, food, I think, is particularly good for rationing. Uh, when it comes to fossil fuel, uh, there, usually my students, they like to write essays about, uh, uh, you know, you have uh, airplane cost, but you can fly the first time every year. It's a, it's a cheap price, and then they are increasing taxes for the second flight. I say, well, <clears throat> so if you had very high taxes on, on, on airplane and other kind of um, fossil fuels, why would you give the first flight very cheap? Without, there are people who don't want to fly at all. So then they cannot use their subsidized first flight. So it's better to just have extremely high taxes on all fossil fuels. And then you, to make it more acceptable, <laughs> because otherwise even the conservative party, they are, they are very concerned with poor people in Sweden, you know? When, when, when petrol prices go up, then the conservative party said, oh, look at Anna. She has two children and she has to drive them to this and these activities. So how can she make it? She's a nurse. Or... Yeah. So they're very concerned by, by income inequalities and poor people when it comes to carbon uh, and uh, petrol and so on. In reality, yeah. Uh, but I think they, they, should give, they should give Anna uh, uh, a subsidy or a payment every month. 1,000 kronor, 2,000 kronor to her tax account if you have a certain salary below a certain level. But then Anna must be able to choose herself what to do with this money. It should not be tied to, to by fossil fuels. So that is a problem in today's politics. When you think about these things, we always think, oh, it must be cheaper to drive a car. It must be cheaper to use electricity. No, it, sh it should be blood expensive. But then she compensate because it's only when the price signal works that people actually repair the houses or they, they, they insulate the houses. September this year had 18% less in energy consumption than September last year because prices were rocketing up, like skyrocketing like this. And the households in Sweden, I mean the private consumption of electricity went down 18%, almost one-fifth, because people thought, oh, this is expensive, maybe I should not have so warm in my house, etc. So it shows that people are reacting to prices if they can. And for those people who have problems, because we must sympathize with these people, they should get direct payments on the tax accounts. In, in Singapore, it costs 100,000 100, kronor per month, per year, for a tax on a car. Private cars are taxed extremely high in Singapore. So there are hardly any private cars. We can do that. Everyone goes by public transport instead in, in Singapore. And taxi. All right, go for the, go, I would disagree with some of this. Yeah, you, you can keep the mic. No, no, go, go for the question. Uh, there, it's, it's in Swedish, of course. Uh, so what can we do to actually make politicians understand the seriousness of the situation. Can we uh, like start some sort of call for the, for the climate so, together with uh, scientists? And are the scientific community interested in 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 doing something like this? The mic, the mic, sorry. So we work together with trade unions and large uh, grass organizations with five million members in Sweden. So we try to represent the people. And we try to push them slowly because they're a bit, oh, we cannot do this, we cannot do that. But we try to help them to, to understand that this is science, this is reality. <laughs> I don't think we know exactly in any country how that's going to drive our policymakers, particularly our national policymakers. But I think we can have much more influence on our regional policymakers and still have some impact on the national ones. And we, again, within, even within the regions, we don't know exactly how that will work. But at least if we're coming together with other people, and we know the area, we know the problems that we face, where we have the same accents, we have the same sort of cultural um, issues that will be very different in some parts of Sweden to other parts of Sweden. So I think there's something about coming together locally and pushing our local policymakers, who hopefully then can also push some of the national ones. And we've seen that historically, is that um, if you look at the last sort of 10 or 15 years, the commitments made by mayors and regional cities are much more demanding than those made by the governments where those cities are. Now, they're nowhere near enough, and they're still not delivering on them. But nevertheless, regional policymakers look much more susceptible to arguments made by local people, local civil society groups. If you, and if we can get the scientists involved, which I think we should do, particularly the early career ones, because they're not so locked in to the prestige of being an academic. But I think there is much more scope for pushing the, the regional policymakers. But I don't think we have to be... We don't know what's the best way. So whatever way you feel comfortable or even uncomfortable doing it, you know, push that. Whether that's protests or whether it's actually engaging with a company or engaging directly with the policymakers, 
you know, I think we, we have to let people make their own choices there because we don't know what the best way forward is. I want to look back a little bit into this like, uh, principle of fairness uh, because we talked earlier about how some countries dominate the emissions. Like there's a couple, yeah. a, few, a few countries in numbers that actually uh, dominate the emissions. And if we look at these fairness models on a global scale, what type of fairness model is mo most prone to be accepted by these high emitters? Uh, because that's might that might be the way that we're aiming for. Like, wh what would be the principle that is mostly generally accepted by the high emitters? I don't think you're looking for a clear principle. Hey, we have to remember that even in a high emitting country, most of the emissions don't come from most of the population. But the real skill of the high emitters, not just the high emitting, I mean, the high emitters occur in Nigeria and in China as well. The people have very high emissions, and that includes professors. The real skill that we have is to pretend that we're all in this together. We're not. Even in Sweden, there'll be massive differences between the high emitters who are responsible for 50 to 80% of the emissions and the low emitters that are percent be responsible for 20% or so. And so I think what we really need to do is to make that break that we. We're not on this together. We are talking about policies that really impact the high emitters in our society. Um, one, the top 1% of global emitters have collectively total carbon footprint that's twice as big as the bottom half of the world's population. And if you looked in Sweden, I bet you'll see ma twice as big, the top 1%, twice as big as the bottom um, half of the population. The, the inequalities in our society are obscene. But those of us who are, who are making up the policy agenda, the professors, the journalists, the barristers, the policymakers, the entrepreneurs, the business leaders, we're all in that 1%. So we never talk about equity. Because as soon as we talk about equity, the light gets shone back on us. And that's why I think we have to be really careful to make sure we break up this idea that it's not about the high emitting countries particularly, it's about the high emitters in the high emitting countries and the high emitters elsewhere as well. So I think that if we could break that out, then you start to say, it's, it, you know, if Sweden's got to deliver 20% per annum, then most of that comes from the very wealthy high emitters. And we know who they are. We know who they are. And remember, it's not just the billionaires. You know, we, I don't know what the average, I, I know the numbers for the UK. The, the mean income, the average income in the UK is 37,000 pounds. The median, if you, have, if you lined up every household, this is per household, took out the one in the middle, it's 30. And the most typical household income in the UK is 23,000 pounds. And yet a professor gets paid 70,000 pounds. A politician gets paid 150,000 pounds. A football player gets paid 300,000 pounds a week. You know, none of that group, the ones who always frame the debate, uh, anything like even the mean, let alone the mode. And so I think we have to break up this, this cozy view that we, that we high emitters have deliberately brought, we're all in this together, because we're not. Do we have any more questions? Yes, one here. Yes, uh, what about the ecocide law? Uh, ecocide law. I support that personally, and um, it is, um, I think the legal way is the right way to go. I believe in litigation, I believe the way we um, stopped the tobacco industry. Uh, they happen to survive, actually. I would like them to die, but they, they, I mean, they, they survived, they got litigation. So I, we have to make um, the oil producers and the oil consumers liable to the damage and loss. So I think I support that things going on right now in Sharm el Sheikh. It's the first time when they discussed it seriously, um, because it's only by, when you have legal, and that's why the European Union and America, United States are so afraid of admitting. They say, "Oh, we can we can compensate you, but don't talk about uh, legal compensation." So that's that's why. But I think it's important both for climate and for ecosystems. The legal side is hugely important, and whether it's eco side or lots of other things there. So I, I give a lot of evidence in court cases for whether it's protesters or whether it's people opposing an airport expansion. I spend a lot of my time writing academic, detailed academic um, evidence for the court cases. One of the problems is that actually a lot of the people who are opposing these things, um, firstly, they have very little money, unlike the developer who always has a fortune to pay. And secondly, very few academics are prepared to put their step forward, their time, their effort, and their reputation because you then have to stand there and be, be attacked by a barrister from the other side. It's a, lot of, it's a lot of work and you have to be quite strong, quite thick skin to do this. But it's very hard for the people opposing developments in legal systems, unless they've got some, um, what are considered neutral experts, academics, and very few academics are prepared to do this. 
um, which I think is a real shame. There's very little money in it. If no, you know, I, don't, I don't take any money for it. But there's very little money in it. But we definitely need more academics to be doing this. And that would give us much more scope for pushing the legal system. And we lose, remember, we lose most cases. But when you lose a case, you change most of the mood music. So if you lose that case for that airport, the other airport that goes to expand knows that they will be taken to court. And they know that there will be a, a, a big, you know, a big sort of PR campaign and then it'll be challenging for them. So I think even when we lose, we are partially winning. I think we have the last question here before we need to wrap up. Uh, I think it's in a really interesting discussion on how wealth is so um, uh, it's affecting emissions so much, and it's not often uh, up in the debate. It's often more uh, rural versus urban, uh, and how in in the Swedish case, it's um, in politics right now. It's mostly like also if we impose um, high taxes on carbon that would affect the, the people living on the countryside and and stuff like that and so with that in mind uh, that you should do more uh, to combat uh, emissions from the wealthy part of the world how can you do that for me i work with politics i mean i i i i want to propose more suggestions for the politicians to to uh, combat climate emissions but it's it's difficult because they all always say that oh no it's uh, it's not going to be possible because it's uh, targeting the rural uh, population so how how can we do that there was an agreement in swedish parliament in the spring to change the um, the deduction for um, transportation to, to commuting and that was good thinking and then the new government just abolished this whole thing and made it much worse. And the, what's interesting, interesting now is that the Minister of Finance protested. So they wrote seven points saying that this is bad for environment, it's bad for our budget and the state budget, it's bad for the local municipalities, it's bad for equality. They, I mean, I think the Minister of, Minister of Finance had really good arguments. But what can you do when, when, when you have insanity ruling? So when you have they're always a consensus from the academic point of view, including the Minister of Finance, that are usually not on the on the environmental environmentalist part. But now everyone was opposing this new decision by the government. So, so if you ask what you're doing, well, don't vote for that government, I think is the only answer. I think the point you made there about the rural and the urban. I mean, that, this holds out a lot of places. And a real, and I, again, I criticize a lot of my academic colleagues on this. There's a lot of discussion about things like electric cars. I mean, there was this another, we always like these new, and I'm not opposed to electric cars, but we shouldn't just be swapping them out with, with uh, in, a, a petrol car for electric. That's still a big car, a lot of pollution. But I think what is interesting is that in our urban environments, we shouldn't really be traveling around by car at all. But in the rural environments, it may well be that is an appropriate place in some parts for cars. So if you're gonna put any charging points at all, I don't wanna see charging points in the city. I do not wanna see car charging points in any city. I don't mind seeing bike charging points, but not car charging points. But I would like to see car charging points in the rural environment, because then you can actually overcome this problem. So when they tell you what about the rural environment, say, well, how many car charging points are you putting there? None is their answer. But they'd be putting them there so they can buy their Teslas and live in the middle of Stockholm and have their Tesla parked outside. So they'll put them in the wrong place. And then the overall way, the, the, one of the, I don't particularly buy this, but there's a, a strong argument being made by, initially by Jim Hansen in the States. And he thinks we should put a very high carbon tax on and any carbon-based activity. And then you, you return the money to all the population on equal per capita. So it's a, they call it a fee and dividend approach. And the benefit of that is that those people who consume lots of carbon have to pay lots of carbon money. And someone else who doesn't consume a lot of carbon gets a lot of money back. Now, they might well increase their emissions. But if they increase their emissions, that puts the overall price of the fuel up. And the other people have to pay a lot more. So it recycles back. So there's a lot of merit to, to this fee and dividend approach. I personally like regulations. I'm not a great fan of using taxes and prices. I think they're generally unfair. But even though I, I don't like those, I think this fee and dividend approach, and there's lots of things written about this, is something that you could imply within governments. It could actually work quite well. It would embed a lot of fairness. It doesn't do everything, everything that's necessary. It, yeah, they've, but we, nowhere has it been applied at the sorts of levels that are necessary, and that's the difference. The, remember what policymakers do. They tweak a little bit, or at least some policymakers, they tweak a little bit and they make out that's a big difference. That's irrelevant. That's part of the problem. We're not after tweaks. We're after, as you're saying, much more sort of fundamental changes to how we do what we do. And um, so don't be taken in by small change. A small change is part of the problem. We've, we've passed that stage. Thank you.
very much, uh, both Kevin and Thomas, for your both your presentations and both your comments and for answering all our questions. Uh, it has now uh, come to uh, the time where we actually have the fika, the, the first fika of the day. Swedish tradition. Um, and uh, we will meet back here again at four. So you have a whole half an hour to actually debate outside or inside here, mingle a little bit and do approach these two guys if, if there's any questions that you feel hasn't been answered yet. Okay.